Hi, my name is Hayden B. Siegel, and I am a Jewish musician, composer, music theorist, and uh, musicologist, or more commonly known as music historian. And this is Let's Talk About Jewish Musicology. Uh, in this uh, video, um, it was actually specially requested that I do a video on Yosele Rosenblatt, who is a cantor from more modern times. So, uh, a little bit more recent than the last person I did a little bit of a, a bio uh, video on, which was Solomon Sulsar. But both of them happened to uh, have a lot in common when it came to composing new works, as well as uh, bringing in the organ into uh, the Jewish repertoire of music, we'll say. Uh, before we begin, because Yosele is such a recent cantor, we're actually in luck we can actually listen to some of his compositions uh, firsthand. So something that he actually sang himself is uh, recorded and still alive today. So uh, if you'll give me just a second here and we'll go ahead and listen to him recite the Kol Nidre, which is a tune that is usually it was reserved for the um, holiday of Yom Kippur, which is the Day of Atonement in uh, uh, the Jewish religion. And um, it is a, meant to be a very lamenting piece, which uh, you'll find uh, the cantor Yosele Rosenblatt really expresses well as he um, almost cries at times when he's uh, reciting this. So without further ado.
All right, and that was Cantor Yosele Rosenblatt doing the Kol Nidre, which is uh, sung during the, uh, again, during the holiday of Yom Kippur, or the Day of Atonement. As you can tell there, he put a lot of emotion into his singing um, and at times wept with the music. Um, so he's a very talented and uh, a figure within uh, Jewish cantillation. And again, we're very lucky to have a surviving recording. Uh, we'll go ahead and link the uh, that video in the, uh, the, the recording as it is a YouTube video in uh, the description below which happens to have a photo of uh, Yosele, so you can uh, see what he looked like as well. Um, so this figure uh, in, in Jewish music history, uh, he was born in uh, Bila Tserkva, Ukraine, on the 20th of Iyer, 5642. That's May 9th, uh, 1882. Now, I should mention here if i do mispronounce any of the these places or these names please feel free to to correct me in the comment section uh, i'm not a uh, perfect linguist do enjoy learning other languages uh, but uh, i don't always pronounce everything correctly so uh, anyway he died in jerusalem on the 25th of savan that's in 5693 or june 19th uh, 1933. So he lived during probably one of the most interesting periods of modern Jewish history. Um, I'm sure that the the conflicts and the questions that were faced by the Jewish community within his time had been faced several times throughout history. Um, however, due to how recent uh, this time period is to our own. Uh, there's a lot more insight that we, we gain. Uh, during this period that he was alive, um, the Jewish identity as we know it was publicly questioned and redetermined both internally within the Jewish community as well as externally. And so we see this within Yosele's own life, within the decisions that he makes as a cantor, as a public figure, um, really shape who he is um, and, and not just who he is but who the Jews of his era are um, and during this time our heritage again it's it's determined or redetermined I should say both externally and internally as uh, things like the uh, Zionism modern Zionism the return to Israel is uh, is brought before the League of Nations um, it, which forced us to uh, put together the Jewish agency, which determined legally what it means to be a uh, Jewish um, on an international scale, behind international law. So there is a, a legal uh, definition of what it means to be Jewish. Um, and then also within his, his lifetime, we see the creation of the United Jewish Appeal, which did the same thing, but um, locally within the United States, uh, since Congress uh, determined that they couldn't uh, violate the First Amendment by determining what it means to be a member of this religion or this community, uh, they offloaded that decision to the Jewish community to internally uh, determine. And I'll put a pin in that specific point because we're gonna get back to it uh, later on in the video as we go through who Yosele's life. Uh, but uh, just to, to give a full scope here, there were other things that were being determined as well, uh, such as should the prayers or the psalm melodies within the Jewish religion, should they be made publicly available to non-Jews? Should this be something that enters the public space or should it be cloistered uh, within the synagogue to give it reverence? Uh, me personally, I believe that, you know, uh, at least when it comes to prayers, uh, that is something that needs to kind of stay within the uh, synagogue so that way it, it remains holy, so that way it, it, it keeps its reverence. However, um, Yosele, being a Hasidic, uh, would have been the opposite side of that and believed that it should be introduced into the public space so that way more people can interact with it. Uh, but uh, on top of this question, uh, we also see, you know, 
uh, again, what it means to be Jewish, if it's, uh, you know, a heritage by genetics or a heritage within our faith get answered, which ultimately cost several thousand, several million people's lives within Europe as well as within America, even with the, the Holocaust and the Nazis aside, we still had issues here in America with that sort of stuff going on uh, that often gets forgotten or glossed over. And uh, ultimately, both the United Jewish Appeal and the Jewish Agency, the Jewish community at large, determined that it's not a genetic question. Uh, we don't believe in eugenics, uh, but it is our faith that makes us Jews. So our, our, our soul, or to quote from the Torah, uh, you are holy because I, Adonai, uh, makes you holy, right? Uh, instead of being holy because of who your ancestors are. Although your ancestors are very important for you culturally, uh, they wouldn't necessarily determine your status as a Jewish person, as we can tell again within the Torah, several Israelites die, essentially, uh, because their faith was found wanting, right? Uh, and then even atop that, uh, the U UNESCO determined this question as well uh, when discussing cultural heritage. Um, Kurt Stern actually wrote a paper with uh, uh, for UNESCO during this period of time, or just following the death of Yosele in, in uh, uh, about 20 years later, uh, following the Holocaust, it, wherein he described uh, race as human. There's only one race that's human, which is the message that Abraham himself carried down. So, uh, and then beyond the identity questions, we also had a question of how should we return to the land, especially in Yosele's life, uh, the return to Israel was very hotly debated. Um, and with that, there was the question of, do we storm in there? Do we go peacefully? Um, what do we do with the people that are living there? And so on and so forth. And then there was resistance uh, within the land of Eretz Israel to the movement to Israel as well. Uh, well, really from neighbors surrounding Eretz Israel within the land of Eretz Israel, it was widely agreed through three separate treaties that it would be a, a Jewish homeland and that the Jews should have a right to return there. Uh, but then you have external forces from neighbors and then also parts of Europe that, you know, determined it shouldn't be, resulting in um, essentially a lot of like back and forth until the creation of the modern state of Israel. Um, following the uh, Second World War. Um, however, those original treaties that were all signed were never nullified, so the question of if it should be a single state or a two-state solution still remain on the table. And these were all things that were being discussed in the middle of Yosele's life, you know, so to have experienced living back then and had to grapple with these, these very personal uh, in important questions to the Jewish community uh, must have been just absolutely tremendous. And even in our own time, we still see ourselves wrestling with that. Uh, for example, with the mapping of the human genome, eugenics has uh, basically been rebirthed and started to rear its ugly head again. Um, you know, and uh, so due to that, we have people identifying genetically as Jewish rather than by faith. And this is very important because that specific point will come about later on in this video when we get into uh, the details of Yosele's life. So without further ado, I guess uh, I should move on with it and let's let's go into who is the cantor Yosele Rosenblatt. Well, as I said, he was a, a Hasidic Jew, so he was born um, to a Hasidic family. Uh, in uh, Lila Tserkova, Cir <laughs> Ukraine, again on the 20th of Iyer, 5642, or uh, by the Christian calendar, again, that's May 9th, 1882. Uh, from a very early age, when he was in the cradle, they, his family re uh, told that uh, he would sing as an infant. And um, by the age of seven, 
this was uh, definitely noticed. And so his family moved uh, to Austria, to Sadagora Bukovina, Austria, at the age of seven, uh, where he was instantly recognized as a child prodigy. Um, this level of status was in no small part probably due to the fact that his father was a cantor in Kiev, his great grandfather was his grandfather was a cantor as well. His great grandfather was a cantor. He came from five generations of cantors, um, and ultimately, all that uh, musical knowledge and technique was definitely passed down to him at a very early age. Um, so, due to this, uh, he began to tour as a uh, assistant or apprentice uh, with the Rebbe of uh, Sedgoria in Austria in order to supplement his family's income. So they would move between synagogue to synagogue, um, hosting service as cantors, and um, Yostele would learn from that Rebbe. Now, Rebbe is a specific term uh, for a chief rabbi used by the Hasidic community. And especially where Yostele was, it was a very Hasidic uh, region, Maybe not so much in Austria. Austria was really, at this time especially, a mixed bag because you had the Maskalim, which were the reformers. You had the Nagim, which were the traditional Orthodox Jews, which was mostly my family. And then you also had the Hasidim, who still wanted to keep the traditional uh, Orthodox uh, feeling to Judaism, but wanted to express themselves more so within the religion. And so they sort of would bend the rules a little bit. Um, and there are some, there's a lot of history there, a lot of go back and forth between the traditional orthodoxy, which is the Misnagim, and the Hasidim, where um, they butt heads quite a bit. The only thing they could both agree on was we don't like the mis Masculine or the Reformed. We don't see the, the Reformed movement, which adopted a lot of... Uh, paganism or non-Jewish uh, traditions in order to better integrate within the societies of Europe. Uh, they both shied away from that and tried to keep their roots as much as possible, even though they might debate, I guess, more so politically, we'll say, within how should these traditions be kept, uh, they still kept them, you know. So uh, in the case of Yosele, uh, following the example of Solomon Susser, who uh, adopted the use of the organ within uh, his, within Jewish music uh, or Jewish prayer music, Yosele also adopted the church organ or the uh, sorry the the organ into the the music as we just heard during his uh, rendition of the Kol Nidre. And my family and I would never use the organ ever to do any of these, uh, the, the music uh, during prayer. And even the synagogue I go to now, Eretz El, off 29th and 3rd, uh, this last uh, Shabbat during uh, the Kiddush, myself and a uh, Jewish actor that attends there as well, I'm talking about it and just, he was flabbergasted that there was ever even the consideration of having an organ in music. So it's, uh, even to this day, it is something that is, has a lot of tension uh, within the Jewish community, certain instruments, should you have these uh, instruments within prayer service, should you have any instruments even in prayer service. It's a hotly debated subject. Uh, and like, the, and like the old joke goes, you know, uh, you have two Jews that have an argument and they come out of the argument with three separate opinions. None of those three opinions were the, the original two opinions that they went into the argument with, you know. So uh, we're always debating and evolving through our uh, debates of our identity. It is very much a Jewish thing to question these things, uh, you know. Uh, so, he uh, went around uh, Austria for roughly about 10 years as a cantor's apprentice um, and briefly, briefly became a cantor at Stad Temple in Vienna, Austria at the age of 17. Now, if you saw the Solomon uh, Sulcer uh, video, then you know the Stad Temple was the uh, major synagogue in Ash, where uh, they determined a lot of the traditions when it came to um, musical elements of prayer service in Austria. Uh, the interesting thing about Stad Temple, and actually 
all the synagogues in Europe for the most part, uh, or at least the remaining ones, is uh, it was the first, uh, I guess, publicly acceptable synagogue where they allowed for there to be an actual synagogue building. However, it could not have any physical or, or sorry, exterior um, elements of Jewish Judaism, right? So you couldn't have stained glass windows that faced the street that carried the Star of David. Um, the, the entrance to it had to be hidden. Uh, in fact, uh, if you go to Storrs Synagogue in Stockholm, Sweden, where I used to live in a tent, uh, you actually, to get into the synagogue, you have to go down a little alley and into this courtyard that's hidden from the general public. And uh, on the main street, out in front of the synagogue, there's no windows or anything. So you wouldn't even know that this place was a synagogue unless you were Jewish and already knew it was there and walked down this really creepy narrow alley to get into the courtyard which allows you into the the uh, synagogue itself and this was a restriction that was carried out in Europe uh, against the Jewish community for a very long time um, all the way up until you know post Holocaust era so um, he briefly got to Yosele briefly got to camp there uh, for only a few Shabbos um, where and during this time he studied under a uh, non-religious Jewish musician and merchant uh, known as Jacob Mars. Now Jacob was primarily a merchant who enjoyed playing traditional folk Jewish music, uh, most notably like klezmer music, uh, for example, uh, in Austria. And uh, Jacob helped Yosele learn more about orchestration uh, and arrangement, uh, more so than the melodies that Yosele would use. And this really uh, shaped Yosele and, and I guess polished out some of his roughness quite a bit, uh, allowing Yosele to become a very prolific composer within the Jewish community. In fact, um, out of the 180 compositions that uh, Yosele Rosenblatt recorded, uh, almost every single one of them was his own melody and orchestration. So um, he didn't really do anybody else's music besides his own. And that really plays into his uh, character or his uh, history within the Hasidic community because they really did want to, as the Hasidim really did want to um, express themselves more so within the religion than uh, express their ancestors, we'll say. So, um, very, very, very uh, expressive character, right? Now, um, leaving Vienna, he ended up touring towards the end of his 17th year, uh, Hungary as a cantor. And while he was there, he auditioned alongside 56 other cantors um, to become the cantor for the Hasidic community in Munkak's Hungary, um, which he, he got the audition, he got the part. So he became the cantor there at the age of 18 and formally became, or formally became their cantor uh, following his marriage to Tube Kaufman. Uh, and, and she had actually met him in Hungary. She was a Hungarian Jew herself. Uh, so they got married and then he started working as a cantor at this synagogue. Uh, he was the cantor there for about a year. Uh, and then in 5661 or 1901 by the Christian calendar at the age of 19, Josele Rosenblatt moved to Pressburg, uh, Brats Bratislava, Bratislava, sorry for the pronunciation again, uh, where he acted as a cantor for their community for roughly about five years. Uh, at the end of that five-year contract in 5666, he moved again to Hamburg, Germany to become the cantor there for the next six years. Now, this sort of movement, this nomadicism, is a very popular uh, trend within the Jewish community, not just within Europe, uh, but also within America, with a, within all time. Uh, at this point especially, the idea of having a Jewish homeland um, was up in the air and it wasn't really super duper supported 
Um, so being part of the diaspora community, uh, they moved around a lot, you know, uh, much like I and my family do today, you know, and, and a lot of that had to do with how do we make sure not to let our community stagnate? So, for example, if um, Yosele had remained within the Ukraine, he probably would have violated Jewish law and ended up marrying within his own family, which is a big no-no. You should not do that. It's in Vaikira 19, uh, six or uh, the Book of Leviticus, the third book of the Torah, 19.6, which was part of my my hot Torah, uh, you're not supposed to uncover the, the nakedness or the flesh of your own. So you, you can't have, you know, carnal relations or children with anybody that you're genetically related to. Uh, and so in order to avoid that, oftentimes, especially at, during this era, uh, Jewish men and women would go far and wide to get married to somebody else. This is probably one of the side factors that ultimately resulted in Yosele going to Hungary was to uh, meet uh, Tube Kaufman and get married to her, um, which made sure that, you know, um, he, the community wasn't uh, endogamic or, or uh, committing incest, right? Now, um, at the end of his six-year contract in Hamburg, Germany, uh, or towards the end, I should say, uh, he went to America by request uh, from Congregation Ohab Zedek, which uh, was a congregation in Harlem. I don't, I don't believe it's still there anymore. Uh, but uh, you know what? Hold on. Okay, apparently, uh, Congregation Ohab Zedek is uh, still there. Um, it is uh, not in its original location. It's no longer in Harlem, but it is still in the Upper West Side. Um, so very cool didn't know that was there until just now uh but anyway so yosele was invited to um spend two shabbats with them in 57 56 71 or 1911 by the christian calendar um and they paid for everything they paid for his lodging and his travel so they brought him over from germany all the way to america just so he could do two shabbats and camp for them and they liked him so much that they ended up offering him a 15-year contract so Yosele returns to Europe, finishes up the last year of his contract in Hamburg, Germany, uh, picks up his wife, uh, Tube, and um, all of his belongings, packs it all up, and takes a boat to America, where he uh, uh, then begins to cant in America. Now, upon arriving, uh, Yosele had made such a huge impact that uh, people began to still write to him from Europe, uh, you know, because they loved uh, the way he canted so much uh, that they would write the congregation there of Zedek asking for Yosele. And this is something that will be very common as, as we progress within this man's life, right? Um, so uh, even leaving Europe, he left this, such a lasting mark that people still wanted to reach out to him. Um, so now in the new new world uh he spent uh most of his 15 years there just quietly canting but became a little bit of a local celebrity here in new york um and so much so that uh, he was approached with an offer uh from a, a newspaper company to become their their primary investor and yosele went all in on it only to have the newspaper utterly fail uh, followed directly by this failure the Great Depression started. Um, so Yosele uh, ended up ha being forced into bankruptcy and uh, vowed right then and there that he would pay back all of his debts uh, despite having to being absolved of them through bankruptcy. And this was a common trend for not just the Jewish community, but most Americans. Uh, the Great Depression forced them into insolvency. Uh, my own family very luckily uh, escaped most insolvency uh, and were sort of forced into a I don't want to say forced because we volunteered for, we took it upon ourselves uh, into a role of supporting both the Jewish and non-Jewish non uh, community of America. 
uh, during the time this idea of uh, having those who were solvent who could still support themselves help other people was uh, politically motivated um, it was known as volunteerism which was uh, later on replaced uh, under FDR's New Deal where welfare was actually set up uh, my family did of course support uh, setting up welfare through a system of taxes uh, because volunteerism just wasn't a great solution right uh, specifically from this period of time the my grandmother's father uh, Francis Seeger, Siegel or sorry not Siegel uh, Francis ended up owning a grocery store and uh, like one act of I guess volunteerism that he had was uh, this man came in on Thanksgiving and stole a turkey and uh, my great-grandfather Francis saw this big turkey under this man's coat looked like a pregnant man right and he's running up to the door my, my great-grandfather steps in front of him he's like wait what are you doing you got a turkey under there and the guy's like ah, I'm sorry I can't feed my family it's Thanksgiving and he's like no that's I have no problem with that what I'm saying is you need to go back there and grab yourself some green beans and mashed potatoes and other stuff uh, and just whenever you need food just come back here and I'll feed you out of the grocery store um, and that wasn't the only family that Francis ended up helping uh, so you know uh, but unfortunately for folks like Yosele Rosenblatt, things were not uh, so lucky, and uh, they were forced to declare bankruptcy. This left Yosele with a very trouble, troubling choice to make, life choice, right? Because not only was he forced into bankruptcy, but his contract at Congregational Hebzedek was canceled. You know, he had signed this big, big life-term contract, and after about 15 years... Uh, they had to unfortunately cancel the contract because they just couldn't afford to have a cancer anymore. You know, um, it was very hard times for everyone. So what does Yosele do? Oh man, I got to do something, he thinks to himself. And so he decides he's going to book a tour across America and gain some notoriety. He'd already done this in Europe. He knows what moving around between shul to shul or synagogue to synagogue uh, is all about and uh, so he, he ended up visiting uh, Chicago first for the the high holidays uh, before finishing the high holidays in Detroit for Sukkot so he did Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur there in Chicago and then f moved to Detroit where he did Sukkot uh, and then directly following the high holidays he ended up uh, doing a much larger tour, tour visiting Minneapolis, Seattle, Indianapolis, Columbia, Columbus, Milwaukee, and Philadelphia before ending his tour in Washington, D.C., where he uh, shook hands and met with uh, Calvin Coolidge. And this was at like the very beginning of, we'll say, the um, Great Depression, although the Depression would really take off during uh, Hoover, who replaced Coolidge, uh, his era, uh, signs of it happening or occurring were already there. The country was still reeling from a depression in silver that had occurred uh, pretty much when Yosele was born. Um, and then the stock market and everything started to come back, but uh, still very hard times, right? And so uh, he meets with the president and uh, he does all he does this giant tour across the US and one key thing to actually mention here is when he toured across the US he didn't book synagogues he played regular music halls you know so like he did a show at Carnegie actually uh, for example and uh, when he was in Chicago he did a, a show at the theater but instead of doing like non-Jewish or non-religious music he still canted religious prayers and both Jews and non-Jews alike would show up to listen to Rosale uh, Cantor sing uh, because he had this sort of operatic performance, this beautiful voice that just people respected and loved to hear. This is a very rare, rare quality within um, Jewish music history. There's not really too many people that would show up to listen to somebody sing a Jewish psalm 
much less any other religious music, you know. Uh, well, there are like Christian rock concerts and stuff, but we don't really have that in the Jewish community. So it's it's a very rare and interesting thing that this one cantor was able to break that barrier and uh, basically get to the other side of uh, life, to the other side, to the other community. And part of this may, or mostly was probably due to his Hasidic traditions, you know, of uh, sort of breaking barriers a bit. And not necessarily, we'll say, breaking the traditions. Well, in some respects, yeah, breaking the traditions. But in other respects, bending the rules, we'll say. Uh, so due to him being able to reach that other side, the uh, opera in Chicago ends up reaching out to him to ask him to um, play the part of Eliezer in uh, Halvey's uh, La Julivi, which is a, an opera. And uh, Yosele Rosenplatt says, no, I'm not going to do it. They offer him some more money. No, I'm not going to do it. Finally, they get all the way up to $1,000 a night. And at this point, when they're offering him that money, the uh, depression has actually fully started. People are now taking uh, food stamps, and um, it's just a, a really terrible time for most Americans. So to have turned down a thousand dollars a night at an opera while most people are starving, including Yosele, uh, really defined his character and um, defined how much he valued his Jewishness during this really struggling hard time. Uh, that being said, uh, the opera pretty much bent over backwards to try and get him to sing. Not only did they offer him the $1,000, uh, they promised that he would have kosher food uh, there at the opera. They promised he would not have to uh, play any, uh, perform during the sh Shabbat or during any of the holidays. Uh, and they also promised that there would be no non-Jewish women that would uh, be opposite him on stage. So they found Jewish female opera singers that he could sing with. Uh, despite all this, and that was partially because each time Yosele would tell him, well, I'm not going to do it because you don't have kosher food. Well, I'm not going to do it because I don't want to have to sing on Shabbat. Well, I'm not going to do it because of, you know, the, the women thing. And um, he was trying to essentially make up excuses why he... He didn't want to sing for the Chicago Opera, and uh, eventually, after being offered the thousand dollars a night to do this performance, uh, Yosele gets his, the rabbi at Oheb Zedek to write a letter to the Chicago Opera, uh, wherein the rabbi says, uh, no, we're sorry, but uh, the cantor Yosele Rosenblatt cannot perform uh, your music uh, out of religious concerns. Uh, we apologize. Uh, nonetheless, uh, this, I guess, opened up sort of a door within Yosele, and after having done the tour in uh, across the U.S. outside of synagogues, uh, and having to battle within himself, you know, do I want to? I need to. I need to eat, so I need all this money, but I don't want to do non-Jewish music. Um, he ends up relaxing a little bit, we'll say. Uh, and the reason why I say relaxing is because Warner Brothers ends up approaching him following uh, turning down the Chicago Opera to perform uh, the Col Nidre in the silent picture, The Jazz Singer. Now, The Jazz Singer was originally a book, uh, and then it was a, a play, and then it was a movie. The plot of it uh, from the book is very interesting. It deals with uh, the American Jewish identity. Essentially, there's this son, uh, Jack Robinson, of a cantor of a uh, lineage of cantors. So very similar to Josef Rosenblatt, this, this character, Jack, was born to a cantor, who was born to a cantor, who was born to a cantor. It was in, in their family for generations. And so uh, Jack Robinson... Uh, rebels from that, uh, being the first American-born Jewish member of his family, uh, he wants to go off and do sing ragtime, uh, which was considered jazz at that time. So he wants to go off and perform and be known outside the Jewish community. 
um, sort of mirroring a lot of the tension and struggle that Yosele Rosenblatt had within his own life, right? And uh, the movie comes to a, or the uh, book in play comes to a climax uh, wherein uh, Jack Robinson, a stage name for Jackie Robinson, uh, is in his dressing room and his father is dying and can't, uh, can't during Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, wherein he's uh, supposed to perform the Kol Nidre. So is Jack Robinson's mother, or Jackie Robinson's mother, and uh, I believe it's his uncle, end up approaching him um, before he's about to go on stage. And there's like this really unique subcontext. They get in this huge argument where, um, you know, they express to him that you're denying your heritage. You know, we have this great community. We can provide for you. You will still be famous within, you know, the Jewish community, uh, but you're, you're lusting after this Broadway thing. And not only that, as, as Jack, Jackie Robinson or Jack Robinson's putting on uh, blackface, which is definitely racism and identified in the book as a racist element, they're saying not only are you denying your heritage, but you're doing wrong by usurping or taking, stealing somebody else's heritage. They're making you a comedian. That's, that's what they say to him. They, they say, you're, they're making you a comedian. They're making you into a joke, you know, because they're forcing you to deny your heritage and then they're forcing you to discriminate against somebody else's heritage, right? And uh, this plot line doesn't come across in the movie almost at all. In the script it does, the original script, which I'll link also, it sort of does. Um, and the original script is what Yosele would have read when he read the, uh, the story of this movie. But in the movie, this doesn't come across really at all. The subcontext is completely dropped. And Al Jolson, who plays Jack Robinson or Jackie Robinson, uh, dons this the blackface, which again is a very racist thing, uh, twice in the movie. The one time's in the dressing scene where his family scolds him, and then he does a second performance at the end of the movie where he still ends up on Broadway. It really loses the intent or the thrust, we'll say, the message of the the of the book, um, and really just drivels into this like anti-semitic slash racist uh narrative of the movie um originally the book really identifies with the american jewish jews struggle to maintain our heritage again as i said at the very beginning and this is why i wanted to put a pen in the genetic point american jews were losing their faith by and large you know um uh, they were seeking out Hollywood to become Warner Brothers, for example. Uh, they were seeking out uh, other avenues and just altogether denying their heritage. And in doing that, they would oftentimes, uh, we'll say, discriminate in order to try and seem like they were still part of a community that they honestly never were going to ever be a part of. You know, they were to this day, the Jewish community is still a minority. And this is something that we have all grappled with. You know, watching South Park, you make the same jokes as Cartman does, maybe, because you want to be seen as cool amongst your non-Jewish friends. But ultimately, those jokes are really discriminatory, and they're very mean, right? And so, um, trying to be something that you're not is what the movie wanted to get across or the book i should say wanted to get across now in the book uh it ultimately ends uh with uh jackie robinson or jack robinson uh returning to the synagogue as a cantor and uh the spirit of his father puts his hand on his shoulder as he recites the kol nidre and that's it he doesn't go back to broadway he leaves broadway leaves the racism of hollywood and broadway behind to return to his Jewish roots, which is why the book is really good. Uh, the movie, I mean, it's interesting to see Joel, uh, Al Jolson uh, do his crooning because he was known as a crooner, but, uh, and it's it's interesting to see Yosele Rosenblatt definitely perform in the middle of this, uh, the Kaddish, but uh, it's just not as good as the book. After reading the book, 
uh, I had a little bit more respect for it. Seeing just the movie, I was like, this is trash. But reading the book, I actually had a little bit of respect because they make that point, again, that, you know, things like blackface is just horribly uh, racist and denying your heritage as a Jew to say, oh, I'm a Jew because my family is, but not participating in the religion at all, not going to services is anti-Semitic. And that was something that, uh, it was the subcontext of what the American Jewish community was going through at the time because, again, this movie came out pretty much right as the United Jewish Appeal, which was tasked with uh, determining what it was to be Jewish legally within the U.S., uh, was being considered, you know, to it was being formed, right? And so, uh, very dramatic themes within this movie. And Yosele his life is mirrored in it so heavily. Um, so of course he agrees to sing in the movie, and originally they wanted Yosele to do the Kol Nidre, which was the piece of music that we listened to at the beginning of this video, but Yosele uh, says, no, I'm not gonna do the Kol Nidre because it's too sacred, it's too holy. See, even Yosele realizes that some elements of Jewish religious music do need to be cloistered, need to be kept within the, the synagogue, within the shul. Um, and this is because uh, it should be revered, it should be kept holy. So he said, I'm not going to do the Kol Nidre, but I'll do a Kaddish in the middle of it. How's that sound? A Kaddish is acceptable, I can do a Kaddish. And uh, it's a pretty good re performance, uh, and in the scene, uh, Al Jolson's character, uh, Jack Robinson, or Jackie Robinson, sees uh, Yosele Kant, and this, this uh, scene is supposed to mirror when he was touring across the u.s but so jackie robinson or jack robinson sees this cantor sing and it reminds him of his father it reminds him of his mother and then he gets this chance to go back to uh, new york so he reunites with his family and yada 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 right um so uh this movie actually opens up uh yosale to not just uh you know fame within the U.S., uh, but and fame worldwide, but it really opens up a lot of doors for him. And at this point, people start writing from Europe, merely just asking for Cantor, Yosele, Rosenblatt uh, uh, in America. Like, people address letters as such, Cantor, Yos Cantor Yosele, Rosenblatt uh, in America, and the postman would know where to deliver the mail because he was so famous. Like, they didn't need the actual address. And so due to this, uh, this publicity or this, uh, him becoming a, a quickly rising public figure, uh, he is asked uh, by the New York Public Library to sing the Star Spangled Banner, uh, supporting the war savings stamp campaign uh, for World War I. And Yosele agrees. Uh, so whereas with the Chicago Opera, he says, I'm not going to ever sing opera. No, 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 no. I, I, I don't do uh, non-Jewish. Uh, I don't do non-prayers or non-Jewish music. Uh, he eventually breaks down and says, yeah, I'll do the Star Spangled Banner. And uh, this is very narrative, I guess, for the American Jewish community as we've made tons of sacrifices and eventually been broken of a lot of traditions. For example, um, my great-grandfather, Lewis, was a postman in the U.S. Um, and when he first delivered mail, he was delivering to an all-Jewish route. And then around um, 5630, which would be 1870, uh, the U.S. Congress violated the First Amendment uh, by instituting Christmas as a national holiday, which was very strictly a Christian holiday. Uh, as well as recognizing Sunday as the National Sabbath, which in our time, uh, in, uh, what would it be, 57, 55, or 1995, uh, they ended up using that determination that Sunday is a, a national holiday, is the day of rest, to institute a tithe uh, or a national tribute, uh, which would go towards paying a 25% labor uh bonus premium on any hours worked uh, on Sunday. So if you're working on Sunday, you're technically entitled to a 25% uh, bonus on your paycheck. 
if you're a government employee, that's automatically calculated. If you're working at a private business, a private business can actually apply for a government subsidy to pay that bonus out to uh, employees. So um, back to uh, Lewis Siegel when he was delivering mail and they make this determination, he used to not deliver mail on Saturdays. And now all of a sudden, because Sunday is seen as a national day of rest, the post office closed and he's being told he has to deliver mail to a bunch of Jews on Saturday, which nobody's going to check their mail on his route because they're all Jewish on Saturday, and he doesn't really want to deliver the mail on Saturday, but by law he has to. So uh, these days, you know, large by and large, a lot of people see, you know, Christmas as being a secular or an okay holiday. I mean, there are tons of... Irving Berlin wrote a bunch of... Christmas music, right? And so, uh, similar to Yosele, he breaks down and, and divides himself off from uh, his religious work by singing the Star Spangled Banner. Now, uh, nearly six years later, the uh, U.S. government does fully uh, establish the United Jewish Appeal. This is following... Uh, this is actually right as Yosele dies in Jerusalem, uh, and they determine that the question of who and what it means to be Jew is uh, to be determined locally by the Jewish community. This was really so that Congress could sidestep having to make that determination, but it also allowed them to uh, make the Jewish community completely and independently responsible for any Jewish refugees who were fleeing Europe uh, in preparation, or not in preparation, but uh, fleeing Europe from the Holocaust, which had technically already started. I mean, we all think of the Holocaust as very late in the game when they had already built camps, but uh, Adolf Hitler took power uh, very early. Uh, so it would have been, uh, what was it, 56... Uh, 75, so 1925, if I remember correctly. Um, yeah, 5685, sorry. So 1925 is when uh, Hitler would have taken power. So already the persecution had begun as soon as that dude took power. And even before that, there was anti-Semitic persecution that was very extreme in Europe. My family fled Austria before World War I because of a lot of issues. There were battles between the Maskalim and the Hasidim and the Misnagim that they just didn't feel like they wanted to argue anymore. And on top of that, there was this idea of eugenics that was going on. Uh, the uh, European community had determined that there was a Jewish gene and that we were diseased people somehow, you know. Um, a lot of these things that are being reintroduced into modern America modern society with the mapping of the human genome you know uh people see judaism as being something that's determined by dna alone or uh something that carries with it uh genetic disorders like tay sachs and so on and so forth but uh we didn't see it that way you know for us it was a faith-based thing um for example uh cousins not real related cousins but we called them cousins because they were such great friends of the family uh joseph uh Leibovitz in chicago uh was he was he was a black jew you know and he used to have dinner with the family all the time you know um so we always at least within my family always saw it as you know your faith is what determines you as a jew not your skin color not your dna you know, and um, that was very much what the entire Jewish community of America also felt. So, uh, as such, the United Jewish Appeal determined that, yeah, it's a faith-based thing. You're either Jewish, uh, you, you can be Jewish because your mother is, uh, but you also can't have converted to any other religion since, or given up the religion since. So if you become an atheist, then you're not Jewish anymore. You know, if you become a Buddhist, then you're not Jewish anymore, you know, and so on and so forth. Um, and you could also have converted to Judaism. That's the other requirement. So it's either, if I remember the correct language of the law, it's uh, your mother is Jewish, or you have converted to Jew Judaism, or you're the spouse of a Jew who is not converted to any other religion since. Um, 
very plain and simple. But it's a lot of people think that it's a DNA thing, and as long as your parents are Jewish, then you can have tattoos and still be Jewish. It just isn't the case, right? So this is all being determined during uh, Yosle's life, and with that, uh, he opens up a little bit more and ends up, uh, you know, uh, accepting a second movie. Uh, and this movie is supposed to be shot in Eretz Israel or uh, the mandatory Palestine, right? Uh, depending on if you agree that World War I happened and that uh, the Treaty of Severus, Louisiana, and Versailles were all signed. Uh, if you believe that World War I happened, then it's Eretz Israel because it was the single state that was signed over to the Jewish people by the locally elected representatives of, of the people in what was Palestine. Uh, if you don't believe World War I happened, then the British Mandate is what it would be known as because uh, the treaties that were signed by the locals, not the Jewish community either, just by the locals within uh, the Levant of where modern-day Israel is, um, all stated that the land would be turned over to the Jewish people um, in 5680 uh, or 1920, right? So he gets this offer to go play a part in this movie that was going to also be about canting. And around this same time, he ends up uh, returning to New York where he signs a 10-year contract as Cantor at uh, Anshi Safrad in Borough Park, Brooklyn. Um, but this this contract was also canceled due to the Great Depression, due to insolvency within the uh, the synagogue, and so um, he's then ended up definitely forced to choose to do this additional movie. Um, so he goes to Israel, and at this point he is 51 years old. And in the middle of uh, shooting, he ends up having a heart attack. Uh, and dies there in Jerusalem, and uh, the chief rabbi, the first chief rabbi of Israel, uh, Rav Cook, who was an American Jewish rabbi, very interesting person as well, uh, or Rav Cook, sorry, very interesting person as well. Uh, ends up presiding over his funeral. If you ever get a chance to uh, research uh, Rav Kook, uh, do so. Uh, not only was he the rabbi that uh, pioneered vegetarianism or veganism uh, because he didn't believe that we should be eating meat or causing harm to another animal, but uh, his family, the Kooks, uh, were known for having an apartment building here in New York uh, that they legally owned and got uh, ownership of but didn't have to pay city taxes or federal taxes or any other sort of taxes so they didn't charge people rent to live there uh, but you had to have a jewish lifestyle and uh, also they had like a farm in the back so you had to help them grow uh, this ultimately served as a model for the kibbutz and the moshavim more so the kibbutz than the moshavim uh, which is the community farm. So the kibbutz, everybody uh, works and lives in the same uh, building and uh, goes to market as a community. Whereas in the Moshav, uh, everybody will have different plots of land, different farms. But when you go to market, you have a collective bargaining agreement. So everybody sells their goods uh, for the same price. Uh, so my family, we started uh, in Israel, we started the Moshav of Ramat Gan. It was an orange mashav, or orange orchard. So um, in my cousin's property over there, there's still a little grove of orange trees with uh, the names of the, I guess the names of those of us who still live in the diaspora. Um, so if you go down there, you can see the little orange tree and there's a little plaque there with our names on it because we donate, you know, for two bishvat trees. And one of those trees was planted for the seagull for actually for my grandmother uh beverly and uh, her children and great grand grandchildren great grandchildren um there are other places in ramagan where the same thing was done by other families because these were all independent plots of land that were owned uh, it was just they went to market uh together as a single unit right so a little bit more uh independence there so rob cook cook sorry rob cook 
Uh, he's a very interesting person himself. I'm sure you can find several videos on him. But he ends up, uh, you know, presiding over uh, Cantor Yosele Rosenblatt's funeral in Jerusalem. Now, uh, and that, that pretty much ends Yosele. So he uh, was a very public Jew, very public figure for both Jews and non-Jews alike in a time when there was a lot of strife and uh, internal conflict and a lot of questions being asked by the community as we became more of a public community. Uh, prior to this age in Judaism, uh, most Jewish communities lived behind walls, physical walls. Like if I go back to Austria where my family uh, fled, the community there, the Kahila that we were a part of, literally has walls around it, you know? Um, and part of that was our own doing. We wanted to keep uh, our own communities and make sure that we had our own butchers and make sure that we had our own uh, fields that we could uh, farm because we wanted to let them lay uh, empty for a year um, as part of Jubilee, you know, and all these other things. Uh, but also part of that was because European society really did pretty much force us into uh, these boxes, right? So as those boxes and those barriers broke, uh, there were just, uh, it was just a crazy time because there were so many questions that were being asked. And the life of Yosele Rosenblatt really exemplifies this extremely because his own character, you see, as he began, uh, he begins his life as a cantor strictly for the synagogue. And although he's altered some traditions as a Hasidic, uh, such as bringing in the church organ, or sorry, the organ, which just shows how much I, I disagree with his use of the organ in, in prayer music. Uh, but even though he, he does that, he uh, ultimately like sort of becomes a non-Jewish uh, figure because he sings the Star Spangled Banner. You know, he, he lets his principles down a little bit. And so maybe... Maybe that's why at 51, in, uh, through a stroke of divinity or something like that, he ends up having the heart attack in, at 51. Who knows? It's up to you. But um, he really did become more so of a uh, figure of vanity or publicity, right? Uh, nonetheless, still great cantor. Still has a lot of great tunes uh, that are still sung today. Um, and as you know, we heard not too long ago, his, his voice was tremendous, tremendous. He really put a lot of emotion into it. So, uh, that is Yosele. I think my next video that I will do will be on, uh, Klezmer music, actually. It's a great history. Uh, I'll just do like a quick overview, like I did with Cantillation. Um, and there are several different periods of Klezmer music, just like you would have in Western musicology or music history, where it goes from like... The Gregorian era to the Renaissance era, you know, all the way to the Romantic and Modernism, Postmodernism, and even now post postmodernism, and now something else. Uh, we have that same thing happen within klezmer music, so I think it would be kind of nice to do like a real succinct thing there, too. Uh, anyway, thank you for uh, watching, those who do. Um, if you have anything to add, please feel free to. And uh, definitely uh, thank you, Joshua, uh, for. Uh, having me do this video. I didn't know so much about uh, Yosele Rosenblatt until I did. Uh, my, I guess, purview of Jewish music history is much earlier than this. I like to uh, go further back uh, where there's less recordings. Actually, there are no recordings. It's all sheet music. Uh, but because uh, I want to establish their, the link between the forgotten years or the, the missing years of... Uh, you know, the 5500s on backwards or, or uh, before 1800, you know. Um, after 1800, it becomes a little bit easier to study these people, and uh, there's already a lot of reference material there. So uh, I tend to try and focus on earlier figures just so I can rebuild that history. But nonetheless, this was a very good uh, person with a very good video to do and a very interesting person to study. So uh, thank you for that. Um, for those who are watching this and uh, would like to hear some cantillation, uh, feel free to uh, come to Adarethel 
uh, and I'm sure Joshua would be more than happy to uh, let his voice ring for you. Um, I know that uh, tickets for the high holidays are uh, out there now, so if you just want to support the Jewish community, uh, then you can always uh, purchase those and support a very good shul. So, anyway, uh, enjoy the rest of your week, and uh, Shabbat Shalom, Lashana Tova, for those who will be watching this, uh, you know, uh, after or around Rosh Hashanah, which is quickly approaching us. So, in other words, have a happy new year.